Let us have our first reading, which is Isaiah chapter 6 and the first eight verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him was seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips and live among people of unclean lips. My eyes have even seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go, tell this people. And the rest of the book of Isaiah is mostly about what he sent and what he said, did and what he said. But we feel we've got t in touch in that reading with the mighty God in the temple, seen in the temple, but of course filling the whole universe and beyond. We have a great privilege being able to speak to the mighty God. And we can speak about the small things, pray for the small things and for the large. And nationally and internationally, there is much to pray for. We have the headlines from the Middle East. We see the problems in uh, other areas of, in the center of uh, Europe, but hardly anywhere across the globe is there peace in, in many ter real terms at all. But man against man, man against God. Our second reading is in Revelation chapter 1, the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to read the first 18 verses. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because that, because the ti that time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests, to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierced him, 
and all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with the gold sack, golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its bri brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, and he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Over the last few times that I've uh, had the privilege of coming here and speaking to you, then we have looked at some of the people who had the daunting and unexpected encounter with God. There was a man on his way to meet his brother whom he'd swindled. There was another one hiding in a pit because there might be a marauding group of foreign troops coming to process and take away his grain. Today I want to, to accompany a worshipper going into the temple. This worshipper is Isaiah. But before we get there, he has some things he wanted his countrymen to hear, and God is letting us in on what's been happening. So if we turn back to Isaiah chapter 1, it's really a summary of what is going to follow all the 66 chapters of Isaiah. Like those film reviews which outline the plot but don't reveal too much so you think seeing the film will give you an experience, not just a sketch pad of characters interacting in some way. We're in the southern part of Israel, Judah, as compared to the north, which had the name of, then of Israel and Samaria. There were two chosen kingdoms of uh, Judah in the south, and Israel in the north. It seems to be a land that is always being divided. There was a division of north and south. Today, it's divided east and west in Gaza and in Israel. And just like today, those two kingdoms didn't get on very well. And of course, that's not unusual in politics and power, powerful men and so on. While I was preparing it, I heard the news that Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are trying again to sort out how to have harmonious trade arrangements after Brexit. 
but was something that should have driven the Israel and Judah together. They had a common enemy. Right in the north was Assyria, a powerful nation. And both states had an access to a mighty God. But all they did was to play <coughs> at religion. Isaiah chapter 1 and starting at verse 7. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire, your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty has left some survivors, we would have become like Sodom, We'd have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, where, what are they to me, says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats when you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths and convic convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. I am I'm, they've become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. A terrible description of the people, of the lands, Judah and Israel as they squabbled over what was happening and who was going to be the top dog. We wouldn't like that to be a verdict of ourselves, of our spiritual life. Or should that be of religious actions? How do our lives reflect the love, our love for God, uh, God's love for us? Or are they bribes to God to let us have an easy time of it? What do we do to improve the life of others? Is our spiritual life really God honoring? We can only look at some of the highlights and lowlights in the first few chapters of Isaiah. The early part of chapter 2 is something of the future that God's people are promised if they're really his. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In these last, the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will bear their sword, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Judah, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So looking beyond the squabbling that's going on between these two 
parts of one nation. God promises peace. They can take their spears and turn them into plows and shearing of uh, and cutting of grain and shearing of sheep. The commentary by Alex Matthaya says of these things that these are the things that nations pride themselves about. Broad-mindedness, verse 6. Financial reserves, verse 7. So 6, he will settle disputes from many people. And verse 7. Yes, their land is full of silver and gold. There's no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There's no end to the chariots. There was great military potential in that. They had a religious interest. Eight, verse 8 says, they bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. Not to God, but to what they've done but they will be humbled. So, verse 9, people will be brought low and everyone humbled. Do not forgive them. Unforgiving and humbled. Without forgiveness, everything comes crashing down. Verse 10, go to the rocks, hide in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant will be humbled and human pride brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Without forgiveness, there is nothing that is worthwhile. And we can find forgiveness in our Saviour. Chapter 3 focuses on the misery to come. Words that might be said by war correspondents in our own days. People will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor, young will rise up against the old, the, the, the nobody against the honored. You have a cloak, you must be our leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. But in that day, he will cry out, I have no remedy, I have no fun, food or clothing in my house. Do not make me the leader of the people. Instead of freak fragrance, there will be a stench. Instead of sash, a rope. Instead of the well-dressed, faithfulness, baldness. Well-dressed hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, Branding, in other words, branded for a slave. Your men will fall by the sword, your warriors to battle. The gates of Zion will lament and mourn. The consequences become more and more horrific as we read on. There's a bright patch, I'll leave you to find it, at the end of chapter 4. But otherwise, things are in a terrible state. But there is this disappointment too. Chapter three, uh, chapter five rather. I will sing a song about his vineyard. My love had a vineyard on a fertile, fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with choicest vines. He built a watchtower tower in it and cut out the wine press as well. Then he looked for good grapes, a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Is there no way out? It just sounds like catastrophe after catastrophe. And I won't go on with all the things which are blamed against the people, but they're and the power of their enemies. 
you can read the rest of chapter 5. But suddenly, we're into chapter 6, the one we read. On earth, there's disaster. And you only have to look around at our today's world. The number of disasters. Yes, there's Gaza and Israel. There's Russia and Ukraine. But country after country has its conflicts and its terrors and its bad things. And, but in heaven, there is worship. There is triumph. Chapter 6 we read and had, did read. In the year King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. Used to be an old chorus that we used to sing. God is still on the throne and he will remember his own. Yes, among all this chaos, of Isaiah's world and our own world. There's still God. There's still the Lord. And we read how he was on his throne and the temple was filled by the train of his robe. And the seraphim sang and flew around. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah had been a spectator of judgment and disaster. It seems that everything and everyone, was, including God, was against his people. But Isaiah had the vision of a mighty triumph from God in his throne, ruling over heaven. His own home and earth as his domain gives him a whole new view of life. And we look round at our world and we see all sorts of strange and curious things happening in these days where there are conflicts which shouldn't need to be conflicts if only people would work together. There's a uh, podcast that the BBC put out thing uh, entitled, Things Fell Apart, about the lack of understanding and kindness in our modern world. A typical exam, uh, installment was a family in the States who took a holiday in an old bus. And on the journey, they wanted a break, so they parked it in a field and somehow it was thought that they were a group of troublemakers. The grapevine said there were troublemakers in a bus. And they found themselves, when they woke up in the morning, surrounded by a group of armed men. Just a small microcosm of the world of anxiety we live in locally and between nations. There are so many worldwide conflicts that our hearts might tremble with fear if we didn't have a view like Isaiah on the overall monarch of the whole universe being on the throne. I, I wondered who would be the first one to mention it that I heard this morning on the radio saying we may be heading for World War III with all the conflicts that are going on in this world. To Isaiah, there was also a vision that witnesses that matter, that drive people apart, unnecessarily can be healed. Since the Jewish nation moved into the land, the 12 tribes that make the nation had split apart. The northern tribes, being Samaria and Nazareth, and the southern part, Judah. And too often, as in families, family members who divide have bitter quarrels. Isaiah spoke mainly to Judah, but he had words for Galilee in the north as well. You can look yourself at chapters seven, eight, and nine for these various prophecies. 
but basically one day they were just to be one as the northern area was overrun by enemies. Chapter 6 we've just read is almost a new beginning for Isaiah. Chapters 1 to 5 have been warnings that the day is coming when an unready and unruly nation will be hit hard by the enemy. Does that sound like today's Israel? There are words of light. In the last days, it says in chapter 2, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established in the, as the highest of the mountains, be exalted above the hills. Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Is that what we're praying for? A movement of people to God? Or do we tremble at what may be happening in the world? We have a God who is more mighty than the, high, the strongest of the rulers, the biggest of the nations. People should seek out and find how to worship him. Jesus said this in John 12, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Do we look forward to the day when many come to the Saviour? But it was only by the cross that that could happen. For John explains, he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. But Isaiah in chapter 6 seems to be a new start to the story. A new start, a new vision, a new, for a fresh purpose. King Isaiah, who Isaiah uh, times his story from, diet ruled from about 790 BC to 740 BC. So right at the end of his reign, some 750 years before Christ came, Right at the end of his reign, Isaiah had this vision of the Lord God on his throne. A vision hardly matched, except by John in Revelation that we read. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering of the kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. This is the Lord's day. Every day is the Lord's day, but this particularly is the Lord's day. And I heard before me, behind me rather, a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. I turned round and saw to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing water. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword, his face was like a sun shining in all his brilliance. Our Saviour is a loving Saviour, but he's also a powerful Saviour. He has this description here of a sharp double-edged sword, a message of redemption and hope, but a message also of punishment and a banishment that uh, Jesus is, says for those who do not follow him. Both Isaiah and John were overwhelmed by their vision of God, God himself on the throne. He saw Jesus in glory, such an amazing sight 
that John in his gospel comments on how this fits in with Jesus' ministry. John chapter 12 says, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Isaiah 53. For this reason they could not believe, because Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Both Isaiah and John overwhelmed by the vision. But let's look closer. The Lord is exalted. The Lord was on the throne. He still is. He's filling the temple with his robe. Chartridge isn't a temple, but still the essence of worship can be here today. The angelic beings recognize the holiness of one whose presence they're in. So do we not, not just in the chapel, but every moment of the day, do we not worship him, follow him, be led by him? 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom have you received from the God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Isaiah recognised his unrighteous unworthiness. Do we? Of all the uh, quotations of the Old Testament into the New Testament, apart from the Psalms, Isaiah is the one that is most often quoted. It's quoted more times than any other book, not just the big verses, but those verses that uh, encourage us and bless us, but those which do bring the message. You remember, Philip was on the road and the past came a eunuch from the south who was making his way home and he was reading a book and uh, he was reading Isaiah 53, the message that Jesus Christ is the saviour who can reach out to anyone. But too easily we can be like Judah and Israel. They just play at things. They, uh, the Bible Speaks Today book says they were just playing at justice with bribes and so on. Judah was invaded by Israel. Damascus sought to stave off Assyria. Isaiah said, don't join in an alliance, but Ahaz ignored the warning, and Ahaz became a, some Assyrian satellite, and Israel became a province of Assyria. <laughs> History has meaning. Why? Because it's the way that God is taking us somewhere. Various le le leaders shadowed the Messiah, but chapter 3 of Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who came to save. There is much that the Christian church needs to be doing. There are oppression, oppression in so many parts of the world, particularly our brothers and sisters. I raided your uh, bookshelves at the back there and found three descriptive things. This one here is from Operation Mobilization. This one from Christians, Shepherds Worldwide. Open doors, release. So many agencies seeking to 
lift the load from our brothers and sisters. Let's make sure that we pray for them in a world which is full of misery, full of corruption, full of power sharing and not sharing, powerful and weak, those whom are oppressed by the mighty powers they find themselves in, let us remember that there is a greater, far greater power. God is on the throne. He is our saviour, Jesus Christ. It appeared as if he was, it appeared as if he was defeated. The nails went in. The sword, the spear went into his, his side. My God, my God, have you forgotten, forsaken me? No, he triumphed. He is risen. This is Sunday. Sunday was the day in which he rose from the dead. We see the shuffling around of politics militarism, oppression, sadness, problems of all sorts. But let's remember that there is one who is in charge, who one who has holds all things in his hands, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Let us follow him. Let's give him all the glory. I'll tell you about two books which find very useful. The uh, well in commentary series, God Delivers, about by Derek Thomas, is Isaiah Simply Explained. It's a difficult book to read and very helpful there. And if you want something deeper than the prophecy of Isaiah by Alec Mottire in the I by IP VP, published by IVP, will take you into the logic of the, or the illogic of the political situation, the rulers and so on. Recommend those two books.